Hello, 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 everyone. Thank you for joining us this Thursday. We are back for week two of Tech Means Business that the Mentor Me Collective is bringing to you, especially for Financial Literacy Month. So before we get started, let us know where you're coming from. Uh, where are you tuning in from? Drop your, drop your location in the chat. Put some fire emojis if you're excited, some party hats, and we'll get started in just a few moments. So just for an intro, my name is Kiara. I'm a business slash data analyst by day. And for the Mentor Me Collective, I am a content curation specialist and I'll be your host today. Um, so yeah, we have Talent Acquisition 101 for you and I'm excited. Uh, we're hosting it with The Daily Harvest and can't wait to get into it. So we're so glad to see you. Take a moment to share this with your friends. Post it on your social media. Let them know we're about to get into some good stuff. Tell them to pull up. So as I mentioned, this month we're celebrating Financial Literacy Month with some great Black technologists. I want to take a moment to shout out all of our mentors who have been joining us going into these one-on-one series and sharing all of their expertise with us. We appreciate you. So I'm gonna quickly get into some housekeeping. And while I do that, let me know in the chat where you are in your journey um, and what you're looking forward to learning. Uh, are you in a boot camp, applying to your first role, still in school? Are you glow growing and glowing in your career? And definitely make sure you like you connect in the chat, uh, drop your LinkedIn or whatnot. So we've launched a hub. This will be our house for you to see all the MMC events in one place and any any important news brought to you by the Mentor Me Collective uh, that you can know. Please visit us at our bit.ly. Post it right there. So next month, uh, we're going to be coming to you with Make Design access Accessible. Um, we're going to lean into learning the foundations of designing client-facing applications and enterprise tools, user research techniques, designing your portfolio, fundamentals of accessories, design, and more. Please watch out for that. Um, and again, uh, sign it, sign up for the, Bit Hub, the event hub so that you can see all the events that we have coming up. Also next month, we will be celebrating Access Accessibility Awareness Month with Defying All Odds. Um, basically, our audience will be introduced to the various technical and non-technical spaces within tech. Our hopes are to give you all a general look into the lives of accessibility professionals in tech. Also, at the end of next month, we're going to be going live from the beach, Remote Work Week, with the Mentor Me Collective. Uh, some dope people are going to be going out and really just working and networking and collaborating together. So, the sign up is bit.ly slash MMC dash travel, and that's May 29th to June 4th. So, tell a friend to tell a friend to pull up. And we have a dope referral zone, I know, because I've tapped into it and gotten some great referrals. So if you're looking for a new role, um, check out our, refer our referral zone. We have companies like Zillow, Microsoft, Accenture, and more. You'll drop your resume uh, and the job that you're looking to, the links to the jobs that you're looking to apply to, and a rep from that company is going to refer you. So yeah, before we jump in, I want us all to be able to meet the team, um, go over our mentorship program, text reminders for all things Mentor Me Collective, our dope Etsy shop, and let you know about our financial literacy month giveaway. So our CEO, Chanel, is our founder. She had a vision um, to give back to the community, and that's exactly what she's been doing. Uh, so we really appreciate all that you do uh, for getting non-traditional folk and people of color into the tech space. Javon C, Chief Operations Office Officer, uh, 
has been doing a lot of the back end work uh, with also keeping the wheels turning for this dope journey that we're on. And Dominique G, um, he's our chief strategy and business officer. We call him Dom. Um, he's also been doing a lot of the uh, operational things to keep the to keep this wheel turning. So some new additions to the team. Shade, our graphic designer. All of these graphics that you see uh, for the events, she makes them and they're amazing. Myself, I host a little bit, you know, event content creator. Um, and I may be doing some entertainment things in the future. So DJing and whatnot. And Shabika L is our lifestyle content designer. It keeps us grounded with devotionals and whatnot we really appreciate it and what about you if you have a special skill talent or anything that you want to contribute to this mission this team please let us know uh tap in and see about joining the team did someone say free career coaching we are offering a three-month program for free mentorship for job seeking services and building technical skills for anyone interested in design, engineering, data science, and PMs, I encourage you to apply, apply, apply. This is an awesome opportunity for people looking to break into tech and land a high paying six feet of roll. Get the bag, come on. So if you're interested in being a mentee or a mentor and you have some skills that you wanna offer, please check out our bit.leaves uh, for both of those. Now you can receive MMC text reminders for all things, all events. We have some great things lined up for you and in the works, trust me. So you never want to miss out, sign up for them. Visit our Etsy shop. It's live and we're releasing exclusive merch every month. All the proceeds go towards helping Black and Latinx movies and tech in need of devices and software. Tap in, I got a, a cool piece and it is pretty dope, so. So what's an MMC event without a MMC giveaway? <laughs> so basically what we're going to be giving away is some cool stuff. But before I get into that, here's how you enter the MMC giveaway. Um, attend all of the sessions, bring a friend, pull up, grab your pen, write some notes. We just want to make sure you're getting some good content out of this. Connect with us on all the social media platforms, YouTube, LinkedIn, Instagram, and then complete our online quiz. So we also want you to check in with the selfie. We have a selfie boot and it's pretty dope. Also continue to take notes. Let us know what you learned. Share this with your friends on social media and follow us and tap into our community by signing up to our, our text reminders. So here are some beautiful pictures from the photo booth. I took one myself, but these are amazing. Show us that you're, you're here, you're excited and you're interacting. And here's the QR code. Um, you can also access it from the, the bit.ly to take a selfie. And so, drum roll, please. The giveaway prizes are Apple AirTags. Is it just me or am I losing my keys like every other day? A HomePod Mini, because you know you got to keep the jams flowing. Hydrate water bottle, because what is life without water? And Nano Leaf Smart Light Bulbs, because you know the lighting makes the picture. So, these are the things you're giving away. Uh, make sure that you do everything that you need to do. Uh, just to make sure you're engaged so you can give some, some dope swag. So, all right. The moment you've all been waiting for. Who's ready for the main event? Get us fire emojis in the chat, some party hats, and all the things for our amazing guest tonight. Let's give a very, very, very warm welcome to Amelia. Hello. Hey. Hey there. Thanks for having me. Yes, thanks for joining us. We're really excited for the gems you're going to drop. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm so excited to be joining you guys today. Um, I really believe in the work you do. 
you know, closing the, uh, the racial wealth gap. Um, and I, I thought it was honestly kismet that I was speaking here today because I feel like I do that for a living. <laughs> now we're really excited to hear all the great things that you're going to share. So whenever you're ready, you can get it. Awesome. All right. Um, so yes, um, my name is Amelia Ovalu. Um, I work in talent acquisition at Daily Harvest. Um, I am so excited to be speaking with you all today and just walk you through some of the fundamentals of talent acquisition, how I got into this work, uh, and you know how we can how we can uh, collectively build power even through the lens of uh, talent acquisition. Um, this is a brief overview of what we'll be talking about today. And let's just jump right in. Um, so a little bit about, about me. Um, I'm actually originally from Philly, um, city of brotherly love. <laughs> um, and, you know, for as long as I can remember, um, I was really interested in um, just building power and people powered movements. Philly has a very rich history of that sort of work. Um, and, you know, I went to school in Philly, I moved around a bit, but I always came back to Philly and I was always inspired, um, by all of the activism and organizing, um, and, <clears throat> and building, you know, and just building power. Um, so I, you know, I originally got into talent acquisition actually from the very unconventional path. Um, I was doing or progressive organizing um, for advocacy, advocacy orgs and independent expenditures. So this includes, um, you know, AFL-CIO, uh, you know, Working America, I mean, Working America, AFL-CIO, um, Planned Parenthood. Um, and then <clears throat> so part of this work um, involves issue-based campaigning and then sometimes um, electoral, you know, electoral organizing. Um, and then when you did, when we would do the electoral organizing, I always found myself um, running the paid canvases. So this involved, uh, you know, finding offices, um, you know, promoting, you know, just promoting that we were hiring, um, interviewing, you know, always recruiting, training, doing the people side, payroll. Um, and I was like, every time I do this, we're, you know, every time I, I do one of these campaigns, I always... I always end up, you know, coming back to this work, um, and I found it actually really prag. I found it like very pragmatic. Sometimes when you do, um, you know, any type of issue-based organizing at scale, um, you can feel a little bit removed from the from the mission. Um, and I felt I found it very empowering, you know, at the end of the day to be in communities and. Uh, to hire people who are from those communities and to talk about issues that are impacting themselves and and actually have gainful employment. You know, uh, this is full. It was, you know, I only worked on uh, for organizations that had full time employment, you know, at, at a minimum, you know, 20 to twenty five dollars an hour for for these people. And, you know, at its peak, we would, you know, we could sometimes be running offices that, you know, that were like 80 people. Right, and it was it was just so powerful. Um, so I did this, and sometimes when you um, when you do this work, um, you get deployed. So I would find myself. I mean, I found myself in Alaska once. You know, uh, I found myself in Kentucky, all over the place. Um, and back in 2015, 2016, um, I was doing a one-off project for. Um, Planned Parenthood Federation of America. They had a like an organizing arm where I was, um, <clears throat> I was within a program called the Southern Access Project, and it was um, intended to close um, like the gaps in health equity in the Black community in the South. Um, so I was the state organizer. I was like a senior state organizer for Kentucky, um, and that you know I found the work really you know just really powerful and i was building capacity um you know running a, sec a comprehensive sexuality education um campaign and then also just building relationships throughout the state with grass top grass top leaders uh, and politicians and it was really cool and then you know at the same time i found myself i, I noticed that i had a growth um on my arm and i just 
you know, I ignored it because I was like, this work is really, really important. I need to finish it up. Um, and we were getting close to the 2016 election and I was preparing to be, to go back to Pennsylvania, um, you know, to run a, a political uh, uh, campaign operation, um, you know, out of Pennsylvania. And, you know, at that time I was, uh, I actually was diagnosed with um, cancer. It was a childhood, you know, a rare childhood cancer. Um, and I learned firsthand the importance of self-care. Because I was going to risk it all. I was going to put it off. I had no idea. Um, and, I, you know, it was so important. You know, I had to be on the front lines and fighting. Um, so anyway, um, uh, Planned Parenthood Federation of America, that, that arm of it, they gave me the opportunity to, um, to work as a recruitment manager. So I was recruiting for the entire um, national operation. Um, and, you know, it was at scale. I did it and I was able to work remotely. Um, and I did it until, you know, I can no longer, uh, you know, work those long election hours. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, I was back home with my parents and I just uh, uh, spent that time recovering and going through treatment and sometimes doing, you know, some one-off contract work. Um, and then I had that time to sit and really reflect and think, what do I like doing? Like, I'm always doing this work. I think it's cool. I want to do, I want to be a little more intentional about it. Um, so yeah. I applied to uh, moveon.org um, as a talent acquisition manager. Um, you know, I came in doing talent acquisition for both, you know, the electoral operations and then also for the 501c3. And then I did, I um, got promoted quickly as a talent acquisition or talent and org dev manager. So I was doing the organizational development side, um, as well as the recruiting. And I was, you know, I led all things recru uh, recruiting. Um, so I, I really, really loved it. Um, I had some other, you know, uh, health issues. And I was just in, I just wanted to take some time off to attend to myself. So I actually moved abroad. And I lived in Germany, um, in Berlin for about a year. Um, and wow. during that time, yeah, <laughs> during that time, um, I got kind of pulled into um, the social impact scene and, you know, social enterprises. And um, I started launching my own project, um, which is a startup to um, help close, uh, to help uh, address some of the supply chain, the pharmaceutical supply chain issues, um, in particular for people with chronic illnesses. So um, I moved, when I moved back to the US, I was like, you know, I think I wanna work in the startup. I have a lot to learn. Um, yeah. So that's why I joined Daily Harvest um, and it's been a great experience so far. Wow, that's, that's been quite the journey. Like, thank you for sharing. Yeah, definitely. Um, so talent acquisition. So talent acquisition, um, it's, I consider it, um, very holistic approach. It's, you know, uh, it's a process for identifying, recruiting and retaining the human resources, um, that a company needs. Um, so these are like, if you have a strong talent acquisition, um, strategy, it encompasses all of these things I've listed out here, the work the workforce planning, um, that's doing the forecasting and planning for, um, you know, what your team is going to look like, um, you know, building your employer brand, um, of course, sourcing and recruiting, um, looking into new technology, including, um, you know, the recruitment software, like the ATS um, software, um, some sourcing technology, you know, looking at job boards, um, um, comprehensive onboarding. Um, and then the use of data and analytics. Um, so a lot of people use talent acquisition and recruitment interchangeably. Um, it's not exactly the same. And talent, like recruiting is a function of talent acquisition. Um, I would say the biggest difference is talent acquisition is a long-term strategy, right? You're looking, you're anticipating the needs of the business. You're looking three months ahead, six months ahead, what's happening. Um, you always want to be prepared. So you're getting ingrained with the various teams. You're, you're understanding like, Hey, this team, there's a possibility that they're going to, they're going to be expanding. You know, let me start 
let me start, you know, looking at passive candidates, having conversations with candidates, um, you know, in this function. Um, and you're also, you're also uh, looking at the culture and, and the alignment between the candidates and the actual culture, because you're thinking about that long-term capacity um, and you're thinking about, you know, retention rates. So yeah. you're, so the difference is recruiting is about like immediacy, like you're filling roles right here, right now. Um, it's about speed. Um, and it's, you know, I think the difference, talent acquisition is a strategy. Um, recruiting is an action, right? Uh, now, depending who you ask, uh, some, you know, I tried, I'm trying not to be biased, but some people see, you know, talent acquisition as a better alternative to recruiting. Some people see like, there are some situations where, you know, a re recruiting um, is, you know, is better or, you know, and sometimes even like talent acquisition teams will, you know, uh, hiring, hire recruiting firms and staffing agencies when you have like, um, uh, roles you need to fill really quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so trends and specializations. Okay, there are so many names. Um, you know, at first it was, you know, a transition from being called a recruiter to, you know, talent acquisition, you know, talent acquisition. And sometimes even the title in the title at a, you know, in some places you, you actually are just serving as a recruiter in some, in some workplaces, you're actually, you know, uh, more integrated and in serving as a talent acquisition specialist pro uh, properly. Um, you, depending how specialized it is, it depends on um, the org size, the company, the needs, right? If you look at Meta, if you look at their careers page, like it gets really, really specific, you know, emerging talent, um, university, you know, university sourcing, diversity sourcing. Um, focus less on that and like what skills and competencies are are required. So I would say the big thing is, you know, maybe like a technical recruiter versus a generalist. A technical recruiter actually is very specific and you don't necessarily have to be, you know, uh, you don't necessarily have to be a technologist or you know a, an engineer or anything to be a technical recruiter but you do need to actually know what you're talking about you need to know the tools mm -hmm. frameworks used because there's nothing worse than being on uh, a phone call with a candidate and they can tell you don't know what you're talking about um <laughs> you know it doesn't serve anybody's purpose as good and you don't really have the ability to determine if if the candidate is a fit for the role All right um, but it, it, I will say to level up, you know, everybody wants um, a technical recruiter who can code. So if you can code, you know, and you want to, and you can actually make a lot of money as a technical recruiter, it's a, you know, it's a great way to transition into that. Um, or if you have an interest, if you are a recruiter, you have an interest in technical recruiting and you, and you can code, or you have the capacity to to learn coding, or at least enough to you know run technical screens. Definitely a plus plus. Um, I oh, think uh, a, another big difference. Um, so agency recruiting versus uh, corporate recruiting, or you know in house um, agency. Agency is there's no talent acquisition if you're an agency recruiter. Um, I think. It's very speed focused. You can make a lot of money because um, some agents, you know, a lot of agency recruiters, you know, it's commission based. So if a person is okay. good, you can make a lot of money. However, it's very grueling, right? Um, yeah. And then people, you know, many people, at least anecdotally, you know, prefer working in house. Um, in house, it's a slower pace, but like I said, it's it's more cross functional. You're working in teams. You know, you're not you're not just an individual. So project management skills are really really important, and relationship building is really important if you're, um, you know, an in house recruiter or you know, a talent acquisition professional. Um, the other thing that's really important is from the outset building trust mm -hmm. with your in house because you have hiring managers um, who have like 
roles that are really important, really sensitive, right? And, you know, they're entrusting you to, to have some alignment about the needs for the role and their vision and the culture. Um, so you need to like, it's, it's funny, like in the very beginning, like you almost, you really have to show up and, um, you know, cross all your T's and dot all your I's. Um, and then the type, the type of organization that you're at also um, impacts, you know, the breadth of your work and your responsibilities. I personally would recommend, um, especially if you're earlier in your career working in a startup, um, an early stage startup means that you have a lot more breadth, right? Like, you know, there's that fail fast, you know, fail fast and, and, and pivot thing where you're just learning on the job, learning as you go, but um, you can really cut your teeth early on. Um, and, you know, it means that the nature of the work is a lot more expansive. Like this wheel here, um, you know, talent acquisition is really, it's more so like the recruitment side, the workforce planning side, the smaller the organization, um, it means that you're doing more, even some, even sometimes going into the talent development side as well. Um, and like I said before, if, you know, like at a meta, you know, it means that the scope of your work is more narrow, but it might be good if you have a niche interest or specialty. I definitely had the question about the uh, the difference between like the staffing agency and like in house because it definitely is always a different dynamic when they reach out. It's like, yeah, I need I need keywords. I need to know that you match up to this job. But I didn't know that it was commission based, so that makes more sense now. And you said that with staffing they don't actually have like talent acquisition or it's not really it's no um because it's about just filling vacant you know vacant uh positions and that's it mm -hmm. talent acquisition like sometimes you might encounter a candidate and you're you're like this person is talented we don't have an open role but let's keep a long-term relationship or oh. you can so in some cases there are positions that are created around a very talented candidate right and um, because you have that, because you understand that we have a need in the business, there's a gap here, and this is a really special person who's talented and they can fill this gap. So, you know, let's talk about, you know, creating a role or bringing you onto our team. Yeah. I didn't know there was this many like different roles within talent acquisition. I think the, the people I see the most often have the title either sourcer Mm -hmm. A recruiter. Um, yeah. As for yourself, do you uh, do you find yourself like taking on those roles as well, or like do you do a little bit of everything? Um, I'm a, I'm definitely um, I err on this. I'm a in-house type of person. I'm talent acquisition. Um, you know, I've done some org dev work, uh, yeah. so. Yeah, I am on the side of <laughs> talent acquisition. And then when it comes to my specialties, I consider myself a generalist. I've done some tech recruiting. Um, I do, you know, a lot of business recruiting. Um, but another key, if you want to get into this work, um, if you happen to have a specialty, right? Like if you have, I don't know, if you're in product or, um, you know, you, you come from business operations or supply chain, um, you actually, it, it's a great way to, um, it's a great way to get into some of the more niche talent roles. In, yeah, in you've actually done it. So you know what you're looking for. Awesome. Um, so yeah. Okay. So talent acquisition during the time of the great resignation. So I'm of two minds here. Um, as a talent professional, the great resignation is challenging. Um, I don't know if you're all familiar with this, but basically this has been um, the time, you know, the post COVID where a lot of people have just um, resigned from jobs. Right. And mm -hmm. people are, have had time to sit and reflect and say, Hey, this isn't, you know, this isn't right. Like employers mostly had the advantage before, um, you know, people would interview, they would have the sense that it's an honor for you to interview with us. Right. Mm -hmm. And then when you join a 
when you join a team, you know, you're an at will employee, you could be let go at any moment. The balance of power has changed. Also, um, it's a really challenging market to, to hire people. You know, you have to pay yeah. people more. Every single person is talented. If there's an individual who's talented and you're reaching out to them, there's probably 20 other companies, 20 plus other companies reaching out to them. Um, as an individual and the person who comes from this, I'm like, yeah, <laughs> labor rights. Um, so I say take advantage of this time. Use, use this period to really um, like level up um, your skill, like think about what you want to do. Think about your skills, um, like have conversations. Like, you know, when recruiters hit you up, actually have those conversations and get an understanding of, you know, what you're worth, have comparison points. And, um, you know, you have a lot of options. This market won't last forever. It's kind of a bubble, but I would definitely say strike while the iron's hot um, and yeah. negotiate. Because, um, you know, they're paying a lot more, um, employers are paying a lot more than what they used to pay before. Do you think that it's in line with inflation or I'm not sure if you know, has there been a bubble like before that, that kind of popped? I can't think, I can't, honestly, like I was, I was looking at some stats, like I can't think of a that I know of in recent history, like a time, um, you know, where where we've had like the same conditions. I do think it's a function of um, the pandemic. A lot of people did leave their, you know, a lot of people did leave their jobs and a lot of people had that time for self-reflection. Um, it's a supply and demand issue. There are certain industries where um, tech, engineering, like there just not are not enough people and it's, yeah. Um, it's just like there's a shift in the workforce and the shift in um, the needs and the type of jobs, um, you know, that are being created. That also includes um, anything recruitment or talent acquisition related as well. There's high demand for recruiters. Um, I saw a question, how, how does one with no experience get into talent acquisition? So I talked through a couple of tactics, like Let's say if you're a mid-career professional and you want to transition, if you have a specialty um, and, you, you know, like you do a, a type of work that's very narrow, um, you, you know, it's easier to transition as um, a talent professional within that field, right? Also, let's say you're earlier in your career, you, ha you don't really have any experience. Um, you can start at doing like admin work, like a talent mm -hmm. coordinator, um, you know, it's a great way to work your way up. It's also easier to do agencies, you know, to, if you're just starting out to start from an agency and then transition, transition in house. <laughs> um, um, and then I'm trying to, I'm trying to think of other ways to get into talent. Um, yeah, but like, if you're, if you're in college, um, you know, if you're fresh, you know, if you're fresh out of school, um, there are always there are always agencies that are that are um, looking to recruit um, new people. OK, um, I wanted to just get into um, a little bit of a demo, like the math of of hiring. So I know I'm talking a lot about fluff and, you know, values and, and all of that. So it's actually, um, you know, and this is just a this is just a demo, like, I'm, but we actually do a lot of analyses. Um, you know, when you do when you do hiring, you have to know you have to plan it out, right? If I want to fill this position by this date, you know, you you initially do an intake call with the hiring manager, um, and you ask them like, who is your what is your you know candidate persona, meaning like, what is the ideal of you know, the candidate that you're looking for, what skills, competencies, uh, values, and, and so on do they have? Um, and then you also talk about like what the actual hiring process is gonna look like, you know, you know, a recruiter screen, uh, you know, maybe an assessment or a hiring manager screen, and then, you know, an onsite, in, you know, an onsite interview. And, 
you know, you talk through what that actual plan looks like, and then you talk about a higher, you know, the actual date that they need to hire to have hired that person. So what I like to do is I create a hiring plan, like a very detailed hiring plan with all the steps and milestones involved. And then I work backward from that hired by date. So I go up and then, so I I have like a do, do by dates. I need this by this date, I need that by that date. And then there's the actual number, uh, the math of recruitment, right? Um, yeah. It takes you need to, you do need a critical mass of candidates um, to speak to before you get you actually are able to hire. People talk about it being like this. It's actually like uh, it's really fat from the outset. Like from in from inbound applications you receive might be mm. I don't know several hundred, like four hundred, and out of them you might have I don't know 30, 40 conversations, right? And then from the next stage, it goes down even further. So it means to get that one higher, there's a lot of touches. You're having a lot of conversations and you can actually map that back. You can quantify it, right? Like how many yeah. hours it takes from your day, how many hours by each week. Um, and then it gets more complicated, not complicated, but it's more important, especially when you factor in um, diversity, right? Because you're not only fighting against um, in, you're not only fighting against like just the math, the math of hiring a talented person, but also you know some industries, some industries just don't have much representation at all, right? Mm -hmm. And then, so it, it's a lot. So it means you need to have a lot more conversations. Um, I do want to fast. I do want to go to, um, and this is like a, a sample of uh, like type of hiring plan that you create and then you put it on a Gantt chart. Um, so, you know, there was a statistic, um, Harvard Business Review uh, shared it out a few years ago, back in 2016. Um, basically, the odds of hiring a minority, like in the final candidate pool, um, if you only have one, one person from an underrepresented group, you know, uh, in that final pool, the odds of hiring them is close to zero. In the final pool, if you have two, um, it increases the odds of hiring that person 193 times. And that's when you still account for the size of the that final pool and everything. So with that in mind, you do have to be very metrics based and you have to check at every step of, you know, at every step of the process. And you really have to be um, the advocate for diversity like say it from the outset. And this means that, you know, you are having difficult conversations when you do talent acquisition, you know, you know, you and you do a structured hiring process, meaning um, you have a kickoff, you know, before doing interviews with the hiring team, you have a kickoff meeting um, and, you know, the interview process looks the same and it's scalable. Um, it means that when you encounter bias, you know, you, you have to address it up front. There's a, a some best practices as to how to do that, but you know you are kind of instructing people. You you are educating people about it, and you are like an agent of change of sorts. And you get to see uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, and, be and belonging in praxis. Um, and yeah, and you know I did the science. I went through the science involved. Um, you also get to be really creative. There are so many ways that you can you know meet talented people, and you especially have to get creative in this market. Um, but you know I've done all kinds of things, like from posting to Reddit to you know showing up. I mean I've showed up at all kinds of uh, all kinds of events, like looking through different platforms. Yeah. Um, just go to where people are um, and then heart um, show up with intention, right? Like mm. I don't, you're not, I mean, it, there is an aspect of sales involved, but you don't want to be a person who's selling a dream or selling something that's not accurate, right? Like there's a, there's a, a middle ground. You can be honest about the reality of the situation, but Hey, this is what we're working to improve. Um, and yeah, and um, just a brief overview of Daily Harvest. Um, so you know, Daily Harvest, um, we are a we're a food tech startup. Um, 
you know, we deliver uh, chef crafted food and it's built on organic fruits and vegetables. And um, the big picture, we're really on a mission to uh, rethink the realities of the food system. And we're trying to scale um, our investment in sustainable agriculture every day. Um, you know, the products range from uh, smoothies and, you know, plant-based ice cream and, you know, milk and savory oatmeal and flatbreads and so on. Um, and a daily harvest, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, it's really important. And it's, a, it's uh, you know, a priority for our hiring uh, to our supply chain. And it's a constant focus. Um, I can say, you know, some of the things we try to do in our hiring, it's um, implement that structured hiring process I just told you about. Um, mm -hmm. Partnering with organizations, you know, focusing on underrepresented um, groups um, and, you know, ex working with external consultants on assessing our existing, uh, you know, existing DEIB processes and where our growth areas are so we can act so we can actually stay accountable to our goals. And we, you know, we're hiring an internal person to do that as well. Um, and then there's a, an initiative that I personally really love. Um, it's, uh, you know, a partnership with American Farmland Trust and California Certified Organic Farmers. Um, it's, and it's seeking to uh, give historically disadvantaged farmers the tools they need um, to build successful, viable farms. So it's like in the form of grants, uh, resources. So these are people um, who we can tap into later as suppliers. Uh, but, you know, a lot of the farming industry is pretty homogenous, like, you know, 95% uh, of farmers here in the U.S. are white. So, you know, it's mm. a great way to add diversity um, uh, to the agricultural industry. But yeah, if you see any, if there are any positions that potentially interest you, whether on our website or you have, or, you know, uh, you think that there's, if you, excuse me, if you have like, you know, a specialty or a question about, you know, either daily harvest at large or, um, you know, your own career progression, just feel free to hit me up. Find me on LinkedIn. I'm Emilia Ovalu. Um, I'd love to talk to you about daily harvest or give you advice about talent acquisition, or even if you want me to take a look at your resume, I'm definitely down to do that. Wow. I didn't want to interrupt you because you had so many like data driven insights as well as just you know, insight into like really how it works on the back end, even if we're not trying to get into talent acquisition, just as people like Brooklyn said, um, looking on the outside and sometimes we don't really know what's going on behind the scenes when we apply to a role and we're interviewing, like you really have given a lot of insight. And I've been eyeing this smoothie for the longest time. <laughs> I'm not even gonna lie. Um, Y'all, please get tapped in um, on LinkedIn with Emilium and reach out if you see a role that you're interested in. I do have some questions for you. Um, so, well, one pertaining to Daily Harvest. Um, so kind of have been reading up about like the possibility of uh, a food shortage in the future. <laughs> Has your business model been affected at all like by that? Good question. Actually, so our supply chain is very um, integrated. So on the food side, we only work with small organic farmers and we enjoy close relationships with them. So it's kind of, you know, so to a certain extent, no. Okay. Awesome. So I, I saw some great dashboards, some great metrics. I'm curious. Um, about how large is Daily Harvest? Like how many employees? Yeah, right now we have around 300. 300. So for an organization that size, and I know it depends on the role, but okay, let's just say software engineer. Mm -hmm. Typically, how many people do you see apply to a software engineer role? That's It's a little challenging to say because um, some of those software engineer positions, I mean, it's an evergreen it's an evergreen process, right? But like in general, there, I mean, there's some positions where, you know, get over a thousand applicants. Yeah, that's right? what I've been seeing, like with the LinkedIn um, estimates. So 
then I know you mentioned like the number 30. Is that relevant to like your organization size? Will you screen that many people? No, I mean, well, in some cases, I, some cases I will, this is just, it's a number, right? Like I try not to be overly prescriptive, but, um, sometimes on average now it will depend like there are some positions that are highly specialized where you know it's mostly me reaching out you, you know and sourcing people so i'm not going to talk to that many candidates but but if there's a if there's a a position that's uh i don't know like a comms position and this is not just at daily harvest or in general like i, mm. I think like it's a good starting I think it's a good starting point. Yeah. So like how many people from the big bubble of over a thousand applicants will make it to like a final round interview? So for a final round, you don't, by that point, I mean, you don't want a ton. It's, hmm. it's going to be like somewhere single digits. Lower yeah. Single digits. Just, okay. Yeah. Because yeah. like it's, you know, typically don't have like, I don't know, 10, you know, eight, nine, 10 finalists or anything like that. I think a good number is three to five, but that's yeah. what the caveat. If I always say this to hiring managers, if we feel like the pool isn't diverse enough, is if it's not strong enough, we're going to have to start all, all over again. Like, and it, that's the reality of it. And so for Daily Harvest, do you have certain diversity metrics that is just a company standard? Or um, is that just like you wanting to see more diverse candidates? Um, so both. Okay. You know, me as an individual. Also, Daily Harvest um, has done a good job. Uh, we partnered with this external agency and has really, the agency has like done one-on-one -on -one interviews with everybody just to get a sense, not just like numbers wise, but you know, how people are feeling across the board. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's, there is a real commitment to, to saying, you never want to be in a place that says, Hey, it's perfect. Right. But you want to say, this is where we are. Yeah. Where we want to be. And this is a plan to how we get there. Yeah. That's real. Um, I guess I always wondered just like from the outside, if like people were looking for a certain amount of like, you know, people of color or uh, accessible or, you know, veterans. I mean, this is in general, this is in general in my career. Um, you have to look holistically, right? Like you look, you look at departments, um, you do it with respect to the industry, right? You look at the company as a whole, you know, who's not here, who's not showing up. You, you look by function, you know, mm -hmm. why does, you know, this team particularly seem, seems a little bit homogenous. Then you have to delve deeper because, um, people aren't just statistics, you know, like you have to look at, you know, all the intersecting identities that people have, you know, like it's not, this is just a black candidate. Okay. What about socioeconomic status? What about, you know, you, so it can't be a superficial dive into diversity. And the other half of it is, okay, you have a diverse pipeline, right? Or you're hiring diverse candidates, but what, what is their experience like when they get to the workplace? Yeah. Right. Um, and that's the other part of, um, yeah, diversity, equity, the inclusion, the belonging piece in particular is really important. So if it's not comprehensive, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of like lip service. Mm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I can see that. Um, and I see why it makes it challenging just because there's so many aspects that go into it. But um, that ties into one of the questions, what makes your role challenging? Yeah, um, I'll take it. I won't even answer that on a granular level. I'll say in the, uh, in the large sense, like you have to, there's a fine line, like especially with respect to uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. 
um, and representation, it, you know, when you do hiring, um, I might know that maybe, I, you know, through our, through my efforts or through my team's efforts, like we've tripled representation, you know, uh, we've tripled <laughs> representation here, but it's still not in, you know, it's, it's still not enough. Like the representation might be abysmal. So like you have to, you have to like not be defensive. And this is across the board with talent, right? Because you're the, you're kind of like the first person who's on the line when it's, why isn't this person here? Why isn't this identity here? Mm. You, you can be the agent of change. There are many other factors <laughs> that are involved, but you know, there's a way that you can create, there's a way that you can accept and incorporate any crudis, any, uh, I guess, feedback and make it constructive, right? Like a yes and like, oh yeah, I, you know, yes, you're right. These people aren't here. This is what we're doing. This is what we're going to do to make it better. You know, this is our plan. Because sometimes there is a visceral reaction like, I've, you know, I, you don't understand. There's no people, you know, there are no black women in this industry. What do you want me, you know? Yeah. It's tough. Like, it's a, it's, a, it's a difficult balance, you know, you have to have. Um, do you have any tips for creating relationships with TAs without it being awkward or seeming like uh, you desperate or you begging? Um, in this market, um, <laughs> in this market, have heart. No, um, I would say, you know, it makes it a lot easier if if you are transparent about this is where I am. This is what I'm looking for. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, th these are the things that are important to me. This um, if you if you just talk straight, straight like that, and if you have the skill set, then it's it goes, you know, then it goes well. Like you don't this marketplace in particular, you don't have to beat down the door of mm -hmm. uh, talent, prof you know, talent professionals. Um, I think just uplifting your skills and, you know, what you're looking for, what you're trying to do next in your career and what type of workplace you want to be at. Um, and just also realize that, you know, the power's in your hands, in your hands too, in this marketplace. I think ideally you want to come to it as making, as having a mutual conversation, right? And you guys are making a mutual decision and think about, think about it from that perspective. Um, it should never be, it should never be you begging. Like you don't have to like, and if you aren't getting positions, there are ways to level up. There are a lot of resources to think about like, you know, your resume or, you know, maybe interview skills, yeah. you know, work on, work on that. But at the same time, you know, just come from a position of power. And so with the great resignation in mind um, and this different climate, uh, the need for talent acquisition is also at an all-time high, right? Uh -huh. um, how, how do you feel like in this climate you're overworked or like what, what kind of shortage are we really dealing with with like people in talent acquisition and recruiting and on well, a broad scale, I guess? The demand for talent acquisition is high. Mm -hmm. It's because it's hard to hire. It's challenging to hire right now. And it's mm -hmm. especially for technical positions, right? It means that you can't, I think before, like a couple of years ago, you could sit and rely on inbound applicants, like mm -hmm. post a position and then people would apply. So a lot of the job was just sorting through. It just means that you need to be proact, you know, really proactive um and also anticipating i think i think like now uh being more ingrained in the business and understanding ahead of time what the needs are is even more important so it's like yeah building out the full skills of a talent acquisition uh you know as a talent acquisition professional you know, like you're not and i think that's probably the bigger diff biggest difference like I'm like, oh yeah, I, you know, you feel more challenged in the work. 
That's cool. So for people interested in Daily Harvest and joining, you know, the community, what's your favorite thing about the culture at David Daily Harvest? Yeah, I would say it's incredibly collaborative and um, like I, it's a place where if you have if you if you have the intention to grow or learn, right? Like you can definitely do that if you think that there's um, a novel approach that we can take. Um, you know, you and this is hierarchy agnostic. If you have a meaningful contribution to make, it it's not oh you just started or you're too junior. Um, I, I think that there's this uh, sweet spot in that there's still that startup culture where, you know, you really can make an impact and the nature of the work is exciting. And, um, you know, there's a lot of breath that, you know, to your position, but, you know, we've been around long enough to where we've been able to work through some kinks. So yeah. we've been able to identify some processes to help us run optimally. So it's like no red, you're not constrained by red tape, but at the same time, um, you get, you're given the wings, you know, the, not the wings, you just, uh, given the ability to run with things. And also the culture is incredibly fun. Um, so it's like pretty well, it's really well-rounded. Mm -hmm. So for people who maybe like are in college and, um, looking to try to get some experience to get into talent acquisition, yeah. um, what are some good agencies that you may recommend? Like, look um, yeah. I have to be transparent. I don't, I don't know okay. uh, from the, from the perspective of somebody work, you know, who's actually working there. I don't, because, you know, I'm not an agency side person. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm yeah. I, I, I can't, I don't know off the top of my head uh, specific agencies, but um, it, I could definitely, I could definitely follow up with you. Like in some of my colleagues, have had a lot of agency experience. Okay. Yeah, that would be great. Uh, yeah, Brooklyn asks, is there any software tools you suggest newbie um, <laughs> talent acquisition specialists to learn? Um, it depends, it's largely depends on your ATS system. So, you know, that's the system, basically your, your hiring recruitment software. Um, you, I mean, you won't really be have a one-off chance to learn one that you're not using, but I would say project management tools are really important and they help a lot because you're doing a lot of lateral management. You're working with hiring managers, hiring teams, keeping people on task. Um, so whether that's a Trello or, you know, an Asana, mm -hmm. uh, that that is really, really important. Um, scheduling, anything that's scheduling software, like Calendly, so mm -hmm. important. Um, you know, just keep experimenting with the, you know, with, with uh, integrations uh, for planning and project management, because at certain times, like, you know, you have to, you have to, it feels like you have to be everywhere at once. So the more organized you are, the easier it, it makes it. Yeah, I saw that Gantt chart. It was nice. Um, so what, what's the hottest job on the market right now? Like, what's, what's, what's going the fastest? Like, and what is the most in demand? Um, I mean, software, I mean, software engineers, everybody wants software engineers. Uh, just, it's hard. It, it feels like it's, it, you know, it's like you, you feel like you have to court software engineers, which is, I mean, which is cool. It just means that you have to get more creative. You have to um, really be intentional and be authentic and think about how you can differentiate yourself as a workplace. And it's also a great opportunity to, you know, build out your skill, your employer branding skills. But, you know, software engineers, data scientists, um, like are being snatched up like hotcakes yeah get those hard skills in i mean the soft skills too but like the hard skills yes um, ux uh ux designers yeah that's it yeah <laughs> um 
So if anybody else has any questions, uh, we're going to be wrapping it up in a few moments. I just wanted to bring it back to you. You, sh you shared some really intimate moments about your journey mm -hmm. to get here. I really appreciate the transparency. Um, and do you miss any aspects of like your, your former career, like with, um, you know, the justice movements and things that you were doing and how do you prioritize your self care now? Yeah. Great question. Um, I do and I don't, you know, when you work for, there's a difference. Like you can always, you can always be, you can always organize. I feel a little differently about being a paid organizer because uh, you, at certain points, it feels like you are on the front line, right? Like you don't necessarily get the break, especially when you have goals, right? Like I need to have these conversations. I need to, you know, I need to talk to X, Y, Z number of people. Um, a lot of times, if you're organizing, doing any organizing within the justice space, it does start to wear on you a little bit differently than if you are just, if you're doing, if you have your paid job and you're doing this on the side, like mm -hmm. you can sometimes like you have the space to pull back and, you know, restore or, um, yeah, like but as a passion project instead of like, right. now I have to, I have to. And that's right. putting so much pressure on yourself and it's not like you're doing it out of like a love. I'm sure it's still a love labor, but it's yeah. more pressure behind. Right. Yeah. Well, this was so insightful. I really appreciate like this, this dope presentation you put together in this time that you uh, shared with us all. Uh, can we take one more question or? Sure. Okay. Is there a great need for GRC general? Is, do you know that acronym <laughs> with little experience? Um, yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I mean, well, with little, ex uh, the governance risk and in, compliance, in, in uh, with little experience, I mean, there's there's need for it. Um, so, are you you're asking about like entry level? I like maybe I don't know if they're at there's they may be saying they have little experience, but what's like the demand like for it, and like what's the likelihood of them getting into the role with little experience, maybe. Yeah, um, I, I, I don't like, I, I don't have enough information. Um, like what as I'm not sure like what aspect of it, but if you are able to, this is what I say in general, like if you, the more niche you're able to be, like if you can specialize in something, um, that not a lot of people do. Um, it's, you know, you become indispensable. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we appreciate your time so much. This has been great. Um, thank you for coming out. Y'all get plugged in with her and LinkedIn, uh, I think was put in the chat. Um, so you'll be able to see it. Uh, but yes, thank you so much for your time, Amelia. We really appreciate it. Y'all have a great Thursday. Have a good one.